free in their house. Welcome back to the Praiser House, your official Christian music podcast with Brandon Bailey and Mike Rathke. Mike, what's up, man? What's up? It's been a good week. It has. God let us wake up today. Yeah, every day so far. Yeah, no guarantees each day, but you know, we got a blessing by waking up. That's right. So we, we're excited. I'm excited. I'm excited. Why are you excited? I'm excited because you're excited. <laughs> when you're excited, I get excited. Just, you know. No, we, you know what I love? I love when we get to an interview and we know that the person on the other end is someone we're listening to daily. Yeah. Like they're in our playlist. Yep. I know you make fun of me because, you know, I like to listen to the same song over and over and over and over. I do too, especially with this guy. Yeah, especially with this guy. <laughs> um, well, on the line with us, hailing all the way from Charlotte, North Carolina, without further ado, we're just going to jump right in. Yeah. You good with that? Oh, yeah, I'm good. John Mark McMillan is on the line at the Praiser House. John, what's up, man? Yo, what's up? Yo, coming all the way from North Carolina, huh? Yep. That's North cool. North Carolina. Well, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's man. It's exciting to be on the line with you guys, yeah. Yeah, it's exciting. You know, we, we talk about it at, here at Praiser. Your music is quite popular with our consumers and those that are streaming your, your music, not only just here in the United States, but around the world. So we're super excited. Everyone's been looking forward to this. When we had, we, it was kind of like one of those times where we bring up this schedule to people in our office. And when they realized John Mark Millen, you had people that are kind of running around in circles going, wait, <laughs> you're doing what? And we're like, yeah. well, you know, we'll, we'll let you watch it later. We'll watch you later. later. <laughs> so we like to get started early, man. So we, yeah. we want to know the early part of John's life. We know that you were born and raised in North Carolina. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. And so how yep. did music enter John's life? Uh, I mean, I, originally in church, you know, we grew up um, and my parents kind of came to the faith and sort of the Jesus movement. And I spent the early part of my life and my parents would not like it if I called it a commune, but it <laughs> looked a lot like a commune, you know, and it's, you know, in the 60s and 70s, and people were living together and on a farm. It wasn't weird. Like, it wasn't, no. it, I, I don't think it was, it was super weird. They, you know, my dad worked a job and they just wanted to do life together. And so it was, you know, um, we had uh, meetings that went late into the night and um, just a lot of hippie vibes, a bunch of acoustic guitars and long worship times. And my dad would occasionally play the drums. He's not really a drummer. And I remember, sitting behind him while he would play the drums at like uh church meetings and out on the farm and i just remember it being a lot of fun i you know so th that's how i was sort of introduced to music is through um you know my dad's church friends um and who would play those hippie choruses you that's know so from cool. the 70s yeah like jesus movement kind yeah. of stuff so it's probably my initial introduction to music and and of course, growing up and going to school, everyone's listening to music. And um, I really, I didn't really start playing music till late, later in life. I feel like most musicians like grew up in like a real musical household. Sure. And other than my dad kind of playing the drums once in a while at church, my parents weren't really musicians. I know my dad knew some chords on a guitar and my mom I'd heard would sing, but I don't remember hearing her sing growing up. And I don't, you know, and my dad never really led worship or performed he just had his acoustic guitar every so often i'd wake up hearing him like you know struggle through a handful of chords on a, on a guitar so i didn't grow up in a musical household when i was probably 15 i don't know somewhere between 14 and 16 um a friend of mine came over to the house with a red uh fender strat and nice. a little pv rage amp and he could play all the songs off the radio that we were listening to you know Pearl Jam, Nirvana, Weezer. And oh, yeah. I was like, I sucked at sports. <laughs> and so I was like, hmm, man, this could be my way. This could be my thing. And I was really into illustration. And I, I wish I, I made a hard decision at one point that I was going to walk away from drawing action figures and mm -hmm. comic books and uh, go more into music. Um, as a young man, it seemed to make more um, more sense to me because I wanted to impress girls, <laughs> and I didn't feel like my drawings were impressing girls. <laughs> um, I wish I, I wish I'd have stuck with the drawing as well, but but you know sometimes you have to make sacrifices. And, and so at that point, I kind of 
decided I wanted to learn music. I wanted my buddy Mark to teach me how to play songs off the radio to impress people. And, and you know, the 90s, like the, everyone wanted to be in a band. I, I couldn't think of anything more fun than being in a band. Like yeah. now everybody wants to be a YouTuber. <laughs> you know, but like in the 90s in middle school, everyone wanted to be a rapper. They wanted to be in a band. And uh, I actually tried rapping um, and was not good at it. <laughs> and uh, I couldn't I, I really couldn't handle all the language that you had to yeah. use uh, to, you know, to be in the rap scene in that in my middle school. Um, and, but, yeah, so I, I think I, I started trying to write songs at some point and I've played in little bands and things. And then that's really how I began sort of my musical journey. That's really cool, man. Well, I didn't know that was one thing that we jumped online to talk to you. I saw the comic books. I'm like, Oh man, he, yeah. okay, this is my guy. I, my brother and I ah. geek, geeked out on that stuff. I, I was really, I, I gotta go back to, you know, tell my dad, I was like, dad, I'm not mad at you, but why did you sell my Marvel stock when I was like a kid? Like that was part <laughs> of our allowance. And then now like today I'm like, Oh man, I wish I had that stock. Still. Could have been a retirement fund. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So was that yeah. that's cool? Did was there influence there in the house? My mom's an art major. Did you have influence yeah. on art uh, for drawing the characters? My mom, my mom's always been creative. My, I mean, my dad's always been creative too. But neither of them were like really visual artists. My mom was craftsy. She would like weave baskets and oh, remember when flags were really cool in yeah. like church in the eighties. My mom like made flags and things like that for not just for churches, but people would hang them up outside the house. So she could make stuff for sure and had oh, a great cool. eye, but neither of them would consider themselves like visual artists. So the, I think, you know, really like their generation, I think, um, it was not encouraged, you know, I'm sure their parents did not encourage them to be creative, to get into visual or musical, mm. um, art, you know, like they wanted, you know, I think they wanted other things for my parents. And so, uh, and then in church, church didn't really encourage that so much either. Um, and so I feel like my generation uh, was, you know, my parents encouraged me in That's those cool. areas, yeah. you know, but I don't think they got a lot of encouragement. I wonder if they had, cause they're both really, really creative people. That's kind of cool. cool. It's, it, and it's, um, it's cool to see how even, even those hints of, of creativity in your parents, like they just carried on through to your genes. And I'm sure you see the same yeah. thing with your kids. You see a little. Definitely. Yeah. That's awesome. And it's cool too. You, you the, the Jesus movement, like, like, cause that was the back back to, to the commune kind of feel like that was so, so common, you know, back during the seventies and the Jesus movement, like yeah. the Keith green had a commune, Keith green, yeah. you know, like not, a, not a commune, but a farm, I guess you'd yeah. call it a farm. And yeah. Like, but what's cool is a lot of really cool music came out of that. Those early days, like, when, when we were yeah. working on the uh, classic worship channel, like I'm finding these old like Randy Stonehill songs and like old Maranatha. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, this stuff. It sounds like it just had a cool like folk vibe to it. And then somehow along the line, like Christian music just got into the weeds and it just started starting to sound cheesy. And we got but now we're in a new era where we got people like John Mark McMillan that are like, let's, let's break <laughs> some mold and start doing yeah, something exactly. different. <laughs> Exactly. So, Do you have any big influences from that era? Like as you go through high school and you kind of you're in the band vibe and you're starting to write songs, is there any influence you're like, I'm going to go, it's going to push me to become this John Martin Millen that we know today? Mm, I mean, I'm sure. I, I mean, I'm 40 now, so 20 years, 25 years. There's, you know, like, I mean, I was a big fan of the Counting Crows and Ani DeFranco and sure. um, Pearl Jam. And so in the early, in the 90s, it was very heavy and very stream of consciousness, yep. you know. I think really is later I got more into Springsteen and Bob Dylan and those nice. types of writers, and, you know, and um, so, yeah. And even on like people with dreams, like I was, you know, subtly tapping into my like yeah. middle school era, you know, R&B, you know, um, not so much with the vocals, but with some of the beats and things, you yeah. know, we would pull from like Ghost Town DJ or yeah, um, I don't know if you remember Jade. They were one of my favorites when I was in middle school. I used to lay awake and listen to Jade, Color Me Bad, you know, a lot yeah. of those types yeah. of things. So we actually, you know, when we when we hit a wall, we'll have things that we listen to that we pull from. And we always have a sort of a little bit of an unexpected yeah. or often we'll we'll decide, uh, to ha you know, they're like, all right, we don't know what to do. All right, well, we'll what would we do if, you know, this was, we were making R&B music in the 90s? And because we're not great at that style, it's really awesome at 
pushes us in another direction. We never really land there, unfortunately, but we find ourselves in another sort of uh, place and it's kind of nice. That's so cool. So, I, yeah. so, I mean, I listen, I listen to a lot of different types of music. I mean, I just, I love music. So I love to hear that, yeah. especially for our audience, like growing up and even to this day, I have a management company where we manage one of those artists, not that you mentioned, but in that era, yeah. I know Jay. And um, yeah. always being an R and B head, and so like like Mike and I taught us all the time. We're so blessed, especially for yourself with influences. When people have that much music ingrained in their 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 memory bank, there's so much you can draw from, and yeah. you can like make this wide pitch yeah. range. Hence, why I feel like your success has been, for in, in my opinion, is so it's just it's just layered in all this music that you've accumulated over the years. Yeah, something that you said, John, about uh, the people with dreams album. I was driving, I think it was a couple weeks ago. I was going home for lunch, and I was listening to that album. And I thought. I was trying to put my finger on. I'm like, man, there's something really kind of like familiar about this, but I couldn't really. And and what you touched on, like, you never really landed on it. Like you you were kind of toying with some of yeah. these color me bad and some of that 80s 90s kind of. And I and I and I can definitely feel it's got that flavor from that 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 area from that era. But but it, what's cool about it is it's not like a it's not a replication of it. It's right. just like a nod yeah. to it from what from where you were writing that. And I think that's cool because that's that's kind of how we create new stuff in a, in a world where, you know, we have the same amount of chords to work with and the same yeah. beats to work with, but we take something else and we kind of shade it with, you know, elements of our past and, you know, listening experiences. And then it, it just makes something really unique. So you can't listen to that people with dreams album like one time and be like, Oh yeah, I've heard this kind of music before. It's like, wait a minute, I, I got to dig a little deeper and like really un unpack this, you know? Yeah. Well, we're not too far off the same age, man. Um, so you got into 2000, I'm just right behind you. You got into 2002 yep. when I'm coming out of high school and the songs inside the sounds of breaking down. Can you give us an idea like how that came to be? Because, man, you're talking about all this influences and bands and like every band you're talking about, I was like, yes, I had the cassette. Yes, I had the CD. <laughs> like I, I, if I had a playlist back then, I would have like five playlists of the same thing. But really yep. to understand how you got to this because this really kicks off the discography. Yeah, totally. So song inside the sounds, uh, I... I think that I actually put an album out before that, which is not, you know, uh, public. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's fine, you know, and it, it was great for back then. But it's like looking at baby pictures, and that album was like really a big deal for me. That's when I realized, like, oh, I think I can do this. I can make music, you know. Um, but I'd made that record, and you know, I was touring a little bit, um, and I'd I'd realized I could be a songwriter and. You know, this is really interesting. So, like, I feel like my early career, um, let me just put it this way. I was playing a lot of, like, church conferences and things like that, youth groups and those types of things. Mm -hmm. And and I was playing original songs. And so people were asking me for my songs, nice. right? And and so and, and people were like, hey, where can I get that song? I'd be like, well, I just wrote it. I, I <laughs> You know, there's nowhere to get it. And so I knew... Um, that people wanted these songs, right? And so it was, I feel like it was way different back then. Like now I write songs and I make a record and I gotta figure out how to make people want these. <laughs> you know, I gotta figure out how to like, you know, and back then it was like, I knew if I had a CD, people would buy it because they really wanted the songs. So it was sort of like, I already knew I was serving people. So I had these songs and I'd written like the How We Love song and I knew that people were connecting with that song. And so I, uh, a friend of mine and I went into the studio um, to record some songs. And I, I didn't have enough songs to do an album, but so many people wanted, you know, the songs that I had that I was like, oh, well, I got to write a bunch of other songs. So I wrote a bunch of other songs and they weren't really like corporate worship songs, you know, like, and I hate that term, but you yeah. all know what it means. Yeah. For sure. Um, but, you know, and, and I was like, well, maybe I shouldn't do the like worship song. I might do this other song. I'll do this other album. And um, and then it, then at a moment, at a point where like, well, you know, maybe like why pretend that I'm like these two people, right? Like I'm this person and I sing worship in church. I also play music in the clubs and the bars. Like I'm this person who lives. I'm not a different person in church yeah. than I'm in the clubs and the bars. I'm not a different person at home. I'm not a different person in the car. So let's just put them all on one record. And mm. so the song Inside the Sounds became that record. We recorded it in my buddy's um, wood shop nice. uh, out in the Maiden, North Carolina. 
it's like Denver, North Carolina. You know, we had to stop recording when the, you know, lawn guy next door started mowing the grass. <laughs> you know, you could see light through the, um, you could see light through the walls. That's awesome. Yeah, in That's the cool. in the wood shop, and so it was a huge room. Um, so we got these big drum sounds and stuff. So and and it, you know, every indie was. I wanted it to sound indie. I wanted it yeah. to sound small. That was really the thing, I think. And um, I, I, I think during that time period, now everybody records on their own at home. So everything is a little bit indie. So I think people work really hard to make things sound really pro. Yeah. But back then, I was. I think I was tired of all the big, um, slick sounding things. And we just we were listening to old music, and we were listening to you know I don't know the Strokes and the White Stripes and Ryan Adams and you know you could hear people banging around yeah. in the studio yeah, and yeah. like you know the things weren't right on tempo there's things were the pitch wasn't perfect but it was like you had this human experience yes. and so that's really how that record happened that was kind of what we were doing i think we spent about a year working on that but anyway that's how that record came to be and that's sort of the first record people that was the first record that i released yeah um on, on digital format I love yeah. I love what you said about rather than being two people like I play these songs in the pubs and places and I play these songs yeah. in church like I, I feel like I think I think a lot of people find themselves in that battle of like well I write these songs but I'm a I'm a worship leader so I I can't really do those songs so I just I'll just do worship yeah. songs but it's like you know there's so much there's so much to be written about in the world and I think it's it's um it's refreshing to see songs that are written from a person who we you know walks with Jesus, but they are writing mm -hmm. about topics that don't get a lot of attention in life, you know? And I think yeah. when you box yourself into, I only write songs for the, for church services, then you, yeah. you lose that ability to, you know, you know, dance around those expressions or dance around those topics and ideas that desperately need attention, you know? Yeah. Well, and I think because I've had a lot of success with songs that were really popular in church, I think people are like, isn't that what you do? I'm like, that's a very small part of what I do. Yeah, it's just because that part was really successful for a, a season. You know, I think yeah. people scratch their heads like, couldn't you like make more money if you only did this? I'm like, I don't know. But <laughs> I like doing, you know, yeah. Yeah. I like the broader conversation. Right. Right. Not just sort of what happens in church. Oh, I, I also like pushing the boundaries of what you can do in church and say in church. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, Jesus, the Bible is weird. It is. It's really, really weird. I don't know why we're so boring and normal and, <laughs> and afraid, you know, afraid yeah. of certain lyrics, afraid of certain ideas. Yeah. I don't know why. What's like, I mean, I'm sure I could, I could speculate. But it goes back to what you yeah. said earlier about like commercial worship songs. We joke like when Mike and I were going to Nashville to do a cut, and we were saying like the producer we work with, he had this massive commercial success in the pop world, and you know yeah. we we said like look we don't want to do what you think is like it's a, a recipe for success like we want to yeah. play from our hearts and write our own stuff and we it's like loafers loafers yeah. loafers vans yeah. loafers and we're like we'll take the vans right off of the shelf put them on and rock this <laughs> yeah. thing out yeah, and, yeah. and and we still were giving god all the glory like in yeah. every grain of it and that's what i love about what you've done so far like in your, your career and i know there's tons more we're looking forward to yeah, and it reminds me a little bit of the conversation we had with Young Oceans uh, with Eric Marshall a while back, and he's when we were talking about the Psalms. Like the Psalms are full of language that we would never think to put in a in a in a, a church service song, but it's like that's what our church services are based off. It's based off the Word, and here these Psalms talking about some pretty pretty you know sticky topics, you know. So I think I think we we limit ourselves. I guess is the bottom line. Yeah, and Mike and I like to keep it right between the, the words of weird and awkward, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and yeah. in that regard. With that with that release, though, do you feel like that you when you had that that thought, did it feel like that kind of lined you up? You're like, I know I can push the limits, and my next releases are going to kind of stay in that same vein from, like, where you had that success initially? You know, back then, like, it, it was such a big deal to release one record. Like, it was daunting to even think about the next one. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I think there's, like, several years between you know and in the in the late 90s early 2000s artists would you know spend two to three years between albums or even four years sometimes so like I, and we spent so much time on it so i don't know what i was thinking about future yeah. records you know but I, I i guess like at the end of the day i was just trying to be my whole self 
you know, yeah. and and you're also asking yourself like, what shelf do I fit on? And I think that's hard. Mm-hmm. You know, like what is my place in the conversation in yeah. the musical conversation, right? Yeah, yeah. And you have this really cool thing. It says songwriter has aspects face. J M M says he enters a room with some ideas and leaves with something that didn't previously exist. We reach into the unknown and literally pull something out. Can you expand on yeah. that a little bit for us and our audience? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, it's just creativity. Like, songwriting is an act of faith. Because I don't know I'm going to write a song when I sit down and write a song. I may have some ideas. Um, but you, you you go into a room with these ideas, and uh, you hope that you leave with more than what you walked in with. But there's never a guarantee. Yeah. Right? And so for me, that's what songwriting is. It's And, and like, if you look back, like, if you really want to get heavy – from a theological standpoint, you look back to like Abraham He's the father of the three big Western faiths, right? He's sure. like a really, really important person. And what is he known for? Well, he was in a good situation and he felt like God was telling him to leave for something that would be better, but he didn't know what it was. Yeah. And that's what Abraham did. He leaped, he looked out into the darkness and he left. Yeah. And what's interesting is it, he never really found what he was looking for. And I think that's, that's kind of us, right? Like, we're constantly looking out into the unknown and we are hoping and believing for something better than what we, than what we see, you Mm -hmm. know? And, and that's faith. It's like, you have no guarantees and like faith is what you have when you don't have a guarantee. Yeah. Right. Like you just, you believe. And, uh, and, and that belief propels me into music. And that's what I do every time I write a song I just sit down believing something is going to happen, but there's never a guarantee that anything good is going to happen when I sit down with a guitar. And a lot of times there's not, but those times that it does happen are so good that it keeps me, yeah. um, you know, hooked. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. And that's, and that's yeah. really, I mean, that's how you become a child of Abraham is yeah, right. Abraham yeah. believed God. But I love that. Like what you said, God, God didn't even tell him where to go. He just said, go and I'll show you where to go. He's like, uh, uh, we're leaving. I don't know where we're going. All right, let's do it, God. So it's like, that's how we, that's how we act like our father Abraham is we, we just go and follow God into the darkness and believe. Yeah. That's awesome. And going back to that first album, you know, I was, you made a good point about getting plugged into like your little, like, like not little, excuse me, the worship groups and like the small tour, you know, the things you talked about. Yeah. You're, you're, a, you're a hustler, man. You're a worker and uh, <laughs> you, you got a, you got a good ethic about you. And I love that, that you never, re- it's like, to me, I don't know, maybe I, I don't know your tour history well enough, but it feels like you never stop touring. Like you always are out there trying to perform in front of live audiences throughout your career. Yeah. What, what do you think was that? Like, is, is it just drive that you grew up with, you know, because we get a lot of artists out there that make beautiful music, right? But they just don't get out on the road enough, I feel like. And, you know, coming yeah. from the artist management world, we, we're like, you got to work harder than the guy next to you or girl next to you. What is that like for you? How did you keep, keep just kind of push that out to there? Yeah. I mean, I think if I really want to, like, you know, overanalyze it, it goes back to the Abraham thing. Like, mm-hmm. I like the idea of going from city to city. I've got this group of, you know, people with me. We have this small community. We're on a bus together or on a van in a van. And I don't, I joke, but I'm only half joking. Like I don't trust anyone who hasn't toured in a van, like people who started on the bus. Like, <laughs> I, I can learn to respect you, but <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, this is a truth. I don't, I don't trust you. I don't trust you if you, if you didn't, if you didn't tour in a van for at least a year or two, you know, but it was, it was some of the most formational times of my life, traveling the country, traveling the world. And I get real, I love my family. Like, I love my family. I love my friends at home. But at this point, I've made friends all over the world, too. And some of them you can kind of keep up with on social networks, but some of them you just got to see them. Yeah. And so I just love it. And I don't know exactly why, other than it's like that Abraham thing. Like, I need to leave where I'm at and I need to get out and see what's out there in the world. You know, like, there's this conquering I don't have better language for it, but there's this sort of conquering feeling too. We're like, we conquered the city. We came, yeah. all these people showed up, and we helped them live a better life for just a minute. And we left them hopefully with something good. And then now we're going to go conquer the next city. There's this camaraderie, and it just feels real important. Yeah. You know, like, and, and to me, that live experience, I mean, really, I, most people, 
are like this. Like I, I, I was, I was playing live years before I ever recorded anything. Wow. And so that live experience was an addicting kind of thing. Um, and then eventually we recorded after I'd been doing my songs live for a number of years. And that feeling of walking out and hearing people sing your songs, like it's, it's a feeling that is hard to describe. Yeah. You know, but it's just something I've always uh, loved. I'm, you know, and I even use the word addicted <laughs> to that feeling. You get, you get amped up. Right. And even now I was talking to a friend who was in a band for a long time and he was saying how your body even gets used to that. It's like most people at the end of the day, they're winding down, you know, and they have their wind down. But if you've been in a band or you're a musician that has done a lot of touring, you 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 get amped up at night. Like that's when you're going to work. Everyone else gets up in the morning and you drink your coffee and yeah. you're a morning person maybe and you're reading the news and you go to work and you you know, <laughs> it's sort of like we sort of like get up slowly and we move slowly <laughs> and we work our way into, you know, even like we got to the point where we were, you know, a lot of artists will reset the their body calendar or their their day, you know, their body time. You know, so like you, you would, you would look like, you know, maybe like it, it would be like a different time zone, yeah. right? Like yeah, we'd sense. wake up, we'd wake up late because we know we're going to go on at nine thirty, ten, at night or something. And so like, I wanted to be awake, like, and so you train yourself that way anyway. So I'm at home a lot and it's late and people are going to bed and I'm like, I want to <laughs> do something. Like, I don't want to watch TV. My wife likes to sit in bed and watch TV. We have our shows, and that's a lot of fun. But I'm like, God, I want to do something, especially during COVID. I'm like dying. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what? What can I do? So like, I, I just, I just, I'm just sort of geared that way. I'm an extreme extrovert, or I can be. Yeah. So is that, you know? and so touring is just feeds that. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. Is that kind of where the the studio sushi and things like that came from with the during the COVID breakdown? Just like the need to do something. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, like, and I, if I can be like candid, like, I had a little bit of a rough year, probably three years ago, probably 2018, 2019. I had to sort through some business stuff, and you guys know how that is. It's so boring. I won't even get into it, you know. Sure. But I, it took yeah, yeah. me a little bit of time to recover from some business relationships that weren't quite working, and I had to like make some big changes and. You know, it took a little bit of time, and while things were taking some time, I went back in the studio, recorded People with Dreams, and I feel like I was at this age. You know, I'm 40. 40 isn't old, but it's definitely not at the beginning. Right. And so I had to ask myself, like, is it time to retire? I used the word retire, you know, like, not tour, not make music professionally, make it for fun. There's other things I could do that might be easier or even more lucrative, but I had to ask myself, like, what, what am I on the earth for? Why am I here? And so I spent 2019, you know, kind of pulling myself back up, you know, I had yeah. to like relearn um, what I was doing. I had to I had to have a new plan. You know, like it was it was a hard couple of years. It felt like I was bringing <laughs> I feel like I was pulling myself back up by my bootstraps. And it's hard to do the second time when you do it the first time. There's this like. Oh, we're actually doing this, you know, <laughs> yeah. but when you, when you're doing it the second time, it's like, am I really doing this again? Like, am I really doing all of, you know, and we made happen. people with dreams. Like we booked the tour. We were like, I was like, I feel like we're going to crush this. Like, I feel like I know who I am. I know why God has put me on the earth in this season. I'm ready to go out and do this. We're in rehearsals and it's just going amazing. And the band is just on fire. And we're just like, I know what I'm going to say. I know why I'm going to be in front of these people. I know what I'm going to talk about. I know how I feel like for the first time in a long time, I realize who I'm called to serve and how I'm called to do it. And we're in the middle of rehearsals and I get a text um, from my manager who's like, hey, uh, we might need to move the tour back. Oh, right. Boy. Yeah. He's like, he's like, yeah, but I don't think it's a big deal. You know, like, I think it'll be over in a couple of weeks. Everything will be cool. The next day, he's like, man, this is not looking great, you know, but I think we can, you know, maybe keep some of these dates. And then the next one's like, hey, everything is shut down. Oh, man. Right. Yeah. So I'm in the, this, I'm getting long winded here, but I'm in no. the middle of this oh, like, you're good. renaissance where I feel like I like put myself through um, the ringer trying to like get back in a, 
good space with my music and my calling and what I'm supposed to be doing. And I've made a lot of sacrifices and worked through some hard stuff. And here I am, like, ready to crush it. We actually did it. People with Dreams is, like, my favorite record I've ever made. Mm. And uh, we're ready to do this. And then, boom, shut down. Right? Absolutely just totally shut down. And at first I was like, okay, cool. We can handle this. I've worked really hard, so this is not going to get me down. Like, the music is still good. We still got whatever. And then days turn into weeks and weeks turn into months and turns into, like, a, <laughs> a year. The never-ending story. Right? Yeah. yeah, and I'm like, yeah. and then slowly it starts to wear on me, like, and I'm, I'm like, okay, well, I start doing videos. I, st- I did like a hundred, maybe not a hundred, but it felt like a hundred acoustic videos connecting with fans. I felt like people really responded. I feel like people wanted some sense of normality. They wanted a heart connection. And the older songs especially were like, pe- made people feel comfortable. So I'm doing these acoustic songs and I can feel it's comforting people. And then I'm, you know, and then I've got this other stuff I'm doing. Like, okay, well, I guess this is what I'm doing right now. Like I'm still serving people. Yeah. Right. still ha- have this connection with people and then the politics heated up and the george floyd thing happened and then i was like i gotta shut it down like i cannot even be on social yeah. media right now right. like i don't know how to talk to anyone i don't know what to say to anyone i don't know what to do i don't feel like anything i'm doing serves anyone so i shut it down yeah so yeah so anyway <laughs> uh long story short i I decided uh, to go back and start making new music. We didn't tour the People with Dreams album. I mean, we still will play those songs. Yeah. Like, you know what? Like, maybe it's time to go back to work. Like, I can't, uh, I can't just sit here and feel sorry for myself. Like, it's yeah. this. I got to do what I'm called to do. It, so we're it was back a, in the studio making music. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, 2020 in general seems to be like that. I mean, on a on on a personal scale and on a on a local scale and on a national scale it just seems like that just breaks like so, so the, i mean I, I i hesitate to say it but it's like the lord put the brakes on 2020 and it's just like we need to slow down we're stopping this whole thing for for a yeah. season and for a reason maybe or for a reason that we can't even comprehend but like just i mean you and i have talked like yeah. just in my personal life like there was some stuff that just happened and it's like i don't understand none of this makes sense this makes absolutely no sense but it's like, I guess in the midst of this, though, my choices are either I just stomp my feet about it or I just say, God, I don't understand. And I'm just going to I'm just going to follow you through this. And that's kind of what I, I think maybe part of what we have to do through that. And maybe part of that's what we need to do is just to be able to say, I don't understand, Lord, but I'm just going to I'm just going to trust you. And it's that back to that Abraham analogy. It's like, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where any of this is leading, but I just I'm just going to trust you, you know. Yeah, I'd hate to bring the Carrie Underwood, like, Jesus take the wheel <laughs> analogy, but uh, everything's a song for me. What you say one word, I'm like, yeah, that lyric, uh, but Jesus take the wheel and yeah. never give it back, you know? And I, what I love about yeah. you, John, man, and, and this is some of the other artists we've interviewed as well, like the people that have strong faith and community and are and we know why we're called for the music, is like you just kept on going. Like you, you didn't stop. You you know, you, you diversified yourself. So I got to ask you back, go back about the sushi thing. Are you a fan of sushi? Is that why? Do you love sushi? Yeah, I do. I love sushi. So Dude, we me work. Too. I, I have a producer who comes to the house three days a week, and he and I make music you know, usually three days a week. And we go, we eat sushi every day. <laughs> my, dude, my every man, day. my man, dude, I, I actually, I know this is so terrible. I, you know, I prayed one time. I was like, God, I was like, if we got to eat, can I just have sushi like breakfast, lunch, and dinner? <laughs> I, was, I would. Dude, I, I literally will like have sushi left over. And so for our audience out there, if you think we're weird, whatever, it's fine. We like to keep it between weird and awkward and sushi for breakfast, like literally leftover. I'll do it. Yeah. You know, there's totally. there's worse. When no I was problem. when I was 19, <laughs> I think I did that with McDonald's when I was 19, and I would just say I don't recommend that. That was a hard lesson learned. But <laughs> yeah, so I want to go back to the the touring thing though. So yeah, what's that greatest feeling for you? So as a young guy, you know, who listened to everything, sang everything, got shut up by my brother for singing Whitney Houston. All you know, I will always love you in the shower over and over 20 times, and I'm not a great singer. Um, so you can imagine what it sounded like. I always, when I got into management, the closest I could get to you and to Mike on stage was to, to, which was like, just melt my heart, like make me just ball like a baby, was watching your lyrics being sung back to you and I'm side stage and you look over or Mike looks over and you go, and I'm like, I know. Mm-mm. Is that, is that part, is that one of them or what would it be? Like, what is that that pulls you to the stage like that? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, that's a big part of it. I mean, I think it's the it's the feeling of being connected to all these people, you know, and it sounds cheesy, you know, and it can be cheesy, but there's something physiologically is is that the word? There's something that happens physiologically yeah. when people sing together. I mean, there's big studies. I, I think Time Magazine did a big, you know, um, published a big report about what happens when people sing together, you know? Yeah. And so, like, what we do is not just entertainment. Like, and just before the pandemic, I remember talking to my booking agent, and he was, and we were talking about that report. He's like, wow, turns out, like, people need what we do. That We're not right. just... He was kind of joking. Turns out we're not just trying to make money. Like people actually need us. And I was like, man, they really, really do. Especially in this day and age when people tend to gravitate towards screens. Yeah. I mean, I love my screen. I'm on one right now, yeah. right? <laughs> but people need that personal yeah. interaction with other human beings. I mean, for a number of reasons. For one, it's like it's really hard when you're standing next to someone, you hear their voice and you see their face and you smell them right yeah. we're together it's really hard to uh misjudge them mm. or not it's really hard it's harder to misjudge them it's really hard to not feel some sort of empathy yeah as like when you're just on twitter it's so easy to say something that's just like super damaging and hateful yeah. you know and you and then you run into that person i've had that a lot where i run into people i hate online i run into them like god you're such a pleasant human being why do i hate you online like you're such a terrible awful person online but in real life you're just fantastic you're delightful you know and so like it's a big part of it i mean yeah. is we're we people have to get in this room together and they sing and they hear their voice fit with all these other voices like We've been doing this for thousands of years, and there's yeah. a reason, you know. Like it's not just entertainment; it's not yeah. just fun. Like this is good mental health. This is good spiritual health, yeah. you know. Like this is this is part of what it means to be alive and exist in the world is to feel that connection to other human beings and God, you know. And yeah. so for me, like it is addicting. I feel it in my body. It's one of the best feelings. In fact, sometimes like I get emotional on the stage. I'm like, it feels so good. I'm like, yeah. get all weepy and I mess up my song. You know? <laughs> Dude, nothing wrong like, with that. Oh, sorry guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I love what you said too, like going back, like Mike, you know, Mike's done some touring. I, I've been, you know, all over the world with, with tour, some artists. And what I love is that like, we joke, like I've ridden four, five deep in a four door Jeep, like all over the Southeast. And it was rough. And like for our young audience out there, like young aspiring singer songwriters, like I don't care if like you you know you well I do care because it's awesome that you got that to that awesome opportunities of singing in front of t you know tens of thousands of people. It's a really amazing feeling. Uh, but you know when like you have like a booked out show and you know it's fifteen hundred tickets sold and you show up and like this monsoon came through and no one showed up, you still play like like there's nobody's business, mm -hmm. and uh, you just kind of dig through. So it leads me to the question like, what is your favorite place to tour? Is there a region or a venue or a place in the world that you just like? Oh, I gotta be there. Yep. I mean anywhere where people want to be there. I have played shows mm -hmm. where, and sometimes this will happen, and I I still appreciate it because there are still human beings that I'm connecting with. But, uh, so, you know, sometimes I've done those shows in the past where it's like a bunch of youth groups showed up and you can tell that <laughs> they didn't choose, they didn't choose to be there. They just wanted to be with their friends or someone dragged them to the show. And they're like, God, it was like, what's, uh, you know, <laughs> those shows are not fun. I still, there are human beings you're connecting with. And you can't always see them yeah. in the crowd. Now when you do those where you're like, ah, oh, what are you people doing here? Right. Like, so, but, but generally they're not, it's not like that. And so anywhere where people like want to be there, like I want to be there too, but we do have favorite cities, you know, like we love Chicago for some reason, Chicago oh. and Atlanta and Dallas, um, you know, but really it can be any city though, but those are just the cities that come to mind yeah. where we've had just really incredible experiences. I, I like, you know, I, I, I enjoy almost any size venue, but I really like those like, you know, six, 700 cap rooms yes. where you feel like you're with the people. Stadium stuff is fun. I mean, we opened for need to breathe and we played a ton of stadiums on that tour and it was a lot of fun, but also you feel like they're way out there and yeah. you're here and you might as well just be playing on TV sometimes, yeah. you know? Yeah. But, um, 
I, I still love that. I still love it. But those moments where you feel connected to the people, that's really what I love. You know, the uh, awesome. live at the night album. I mean, I don't know what that venue size was, but you definitely get that yeah. feel that there's this like a, a, a connection with the people and like the, the storytelling yeah. in between songs. Like I, that would have been a cool concert to go to, but that, that is that kind of the, that, that vibe that you're talking about. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And I'm not like, I'm not like a very animated person. Like I'm six, four, 200 pounds i'm not dancing you know what i mean like it's not i'm just there's too much of me i can't move fast enough you know to be so i'm not like a dancer i do have some of the guys you know like jeremy the bass player he's he's all awesome. over the place he's awesome yeah but i'm always thinking how can i get more connected so you know for a while we would always try and get in the crowd like can i actually get in the crowd and sing a song with just, with no microphones, you know, like and they hear my actual voice, not my voice through the PA. Huh. So we do that. We're always trying to think of ways we can get more in with the people, you know. That's cool. And e elevate their experience. Not once again, not just for entertainment, but just their spiritual experience, right? Yeah, for that yeah. connection. And while you're on, yeah. while we're on this topic, is there? I mean, God, you got such an awesome discography and ton of music out there. I love. I mean just name a track but is there one song that when you play this it's like this really just makes your heart just poof, right on the stage it just pulls it right out of you yeah i mean it's different every time yeah. for some reason we uh we did do a college show it's the first show we've done in like a year and a half we did a college show um a few weeks ago and we did the song pilgrim and for some reason i don't even know why when i look at the lyrics i'm like this is a good song but reading the lyrics doesn't whatever but when i sing the song like i just fall apart sometimes really? you know yeah. it's awesome. yeah and it's but i think yeah i, I think it's all it, it's it's subtly about loss you know you're like you know the whole idea of like i'm a pilgrim here but i'll walk with you for a while so it's a little bit of a a lot of the songs on people's dreams are like that a little bit of um what do you call it when a magician distracts you with one hand to do the magic with the other there's a little bit of misdirection yeah you know not that i'm not saying what i'm saying but that i'm also saying something else and a lot of time it's the something else that i think is is most mm. interesting yeah so the song like you know opens up with there's a heavenly city but it's not really about the heavenly city i think some people sing it and, they, and that's fine you know yeah. but it's really not about the heavenly city it's really about the idea that like life here is impermanent mm -hmm. and all the people you walk with it's like you get to walk with them for a little bit. It's like, but you don't get them forever. Mm. You don't get any of these moments forever. Yeah, yeah. That's and one thing. Sometimes we miss that, and that's a, yeah, that's a huge thing. Yeah, we've got some guys in the yeah. office. Um, you know, everyone struggles at times, and no matter what it is, uh, it's very macro this yeah. moment. But we tell guys like, look, you, you're not wearing guaranteed for tomorrow to wake up. Yeah, and yeah. like just to like just a simple reminder that when you do wake up today, like just give God some glory. I mean, just give him some thanks. Just say thank yeah. you, Father. You know, because it's really easy um, going into, you know, that it, it, I thought that you were going to mention that maybe it'd be how his love um, or how he loves, excuse me, um, you know, talking about that, because like we've talked about like close relationships and things like that. Um, I know this is a little bit different from the music and the touring we're talking about. Uh, I, I'm, I got comic books, man. And uh, yeah. so I see that you got the wall of comic books. How did you yeah. get started? Does that go back to your childhood? Because that, that's a pretty awesome collection. Yep. All of these are from the 90s. I bought most of them in the 90s. So a lot of them are signed. I used to go to the comic really? book conventions, you know, like, you know, so this is X-Men 1 signed by Jim Lee. I've got, wow. uh, I got a Spider-Man number one signed by Todd McFarlane. And wow. so most of these I bought in the 90s and I broke them out. Probably I got really bored during <laughs> COVID, you know, <laughs> And I started showing them to my kids, and I was like, "These are so cool!" And so I decided to hang a few of them up, and I, and, and and then eventually it turned into my wall, my comic book wall. That's it awesome. is awesome. Uh, yeah, that is the coolest backdrop I think we've seen on the Fraser House. No, it is. It, no, it is. You you hold the right. We're gonna get. There's a trophy for that one. Um, hey, do you have like one that stands out? That's just like this is this is like the holy grail of comic books. Well, okay, so this is. My first comic book that I ever bought. Okay. It's uh, it's Marvel Presents Wolverine. Sam Keith. I don't know if you know Sam Keith. A he did bit. um, he did the Max, which I had the Max oh, number yeah. one, hanging yep. up here. And it, Max was a show on MTV for a while, if you remember. Yeah, I do. But the Marvel Comics Presents Wolverine. My first comic ever. 
Um, I saw that on the shelf at the drugstore. It's either the drugstore or like the, the video store. You know, yeah, the yeah. VHS rental store. Yeah. Used to sell comics. And I I thought it was awesome. You know, like and and then I think like the cartoon was, you know, happened not long after that. And but like Wolverine for me was great because I remember being in junior high and not being not feeling like I fit in, dealing with bullies and things like that. And I like this idea that Wolverine had this hidden thing, this thing you didn't see. That if you pushed him the wrong way, yeah. he could gut you like a fish. I thought that was incredible. <laughs> you know, and as a kid, like I was so drawn to people who had something that was more than meets the eye, you know. And Wolverine's like this angry old man and if you mess with him, you know, he he he, he might you gonna get he it. might cut you open. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think I gravitated towards comics in you know a lot of ways because i didn't like my real life and comic books were a way they were a big escape for yeah, me that's you cool. know a way to escape you know hating school and mm. dealing you know and by um by the by ninth grade i was also like a foot taller than everybody else and so the bullying stopped yeah. after a while but <laughs> imagine that <laughs> the seventh grade was like one of the worst years of my life i, I think that's you know? across the board i think everybody's seventh grade was the yeah. worst ever Do you, is so yeah. can we expect uh john mark mcmillan in a comic book anytime soon i mean i would love to write a comic book i think that'd be great i don't know that i would be a character in a comic book um there is so there are a couple of guys in town who uh, do work for Marvel, oh, cool. and one of the guys in my band, his name uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Smith. He's got a band. I'm trying to remember what he has. Multiple bands. A lot of my band guys have bands in town. They all go play shows, nice. local shows, and they have different bands with different configurations. One of his band's poster is on the wall in a Spider Gwen comic. Oh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Spider. If you're familiar with the Spider Verse, you know Miles Morales, but yep, yep. Spider Gwen. Those early Spider Gwen books are pretty new, but they're worth a good bit of money because hmm. she's very popular now. Anyway, yeah. so a couple of the guys in town are, you know, have their art, but not me. I'm not currently in a comic, but we'll see. Yeah, see you never I mean. know. Well, we got we we definitely know that that you've got some music that's on the horizon. You want to talk about that? Yep. Yeah. So for the for the for the rest of the year, I'm trying to release something new every three weeks. Wow. I've got wow. I've got collaborations. Um, happening that I'm really excited about. I can't really say uh, because, I mean, you know, we don't do contracts. They're doing it, but, you know, I, I don't want to say because just sure. in case it doesn't happen. Yeah, but I got several of my favorite artists um, that I'm doing uh, collaborations with, which I'm really pumped about. Um, and then uh, I've got new singles happening all year as well. Um, so the first one, which is probably out right now, it's called Deliver Me. Uh, you can go listen to it right now everywhere um and yeah so I'm, I'm trying to tell this whole story the this concept of re-enchantment um which is i don't know if you get in deep into sort of deconstruction my answer to deconstruction isn't reconstruction it's re-enchantment because mm -hmm. the the big question for me is not about how you construct your spiritual or religious life it's about do we do the biggest stories choose us or do we choose the biggest stories? Wow. Right. Yeah. Meaning like if you think about it, all the most important decisions I've ever made in my life and the most important decisions people make in their life, they all make when they're young. And there's nothing wrong with being young. I've met a lot of really smart young people, but people are smarter as they grow older. You sure. learn. Mm -hmm. But how come like the person I chose to marry, my religion, my faith, uh, we chose to have kids. I mean, all these, the job I chose, you know, all these like real important decisions we choose, you know, a lot of times when we're in our late teens, when we don't even know what we're getting into, yeah. you yeah. know, and why. And I think not that you, I mean, you can certainly make the wrong decision. That's for sure. But um, I, I think it's because the biggest stories choose us, mm. you know, and not that you don't have agency. Like I'm a hundred percent positive that we do have agency. You know, but like we have the Internet now where we create our own story. We create our own ideas of the world. You know, But we don't want that. We actually don't really want that. Like if you think about it, everything that you love comes with this loss of agency. Right. Like mm, a song I can't turn off a book I can't put down, you know, like everything that we love, a movie I just can't take my eyes off of. 
Right. You know, and then Damien Rice had that song, I Can't Take My oh, Eyes yeah. Off of You. You know, like all of yeah. this language. You say you want to be captivated by something. What is captivate? You want to be kidnapped. I mean, that's the same word. You want to be held hostage. Mm. We want our agency and our will to be subverted. Yeah. We want something, for lack of a better term, to take control of this. And I, you know, I got to be careful. I don't mean in an abusive type of scenario, but I mean in a scenario where, like, something bigger than you yeah. matters more than you matter to yourself. Like we want that. We want that more than anything, but we live in a world where we ha feel like we have so much control. You know, I have friends who never sit down and have a real relationship with a girl because they just keep swiping Tinder, oh, you know, man, and they meet man. all these off, they meet all these awesome or not awesome girls. Some of them are probably really awesome. Some not awesome, but they meet all these awesome girls. And they never give them an opportunity to develop a real relationship because they have too many options. Yeah. You know, and sort of like at the end of the day, it's like we want to fall in love. I mean, all these words, you know, have this quality to them that is subversive or that what's what I'm talking about that, that sort of wants to take you over, to captivate yeah. you, to push yeah. beyond your will. Right. You know, and so um, I'm trying to tell the story of reenchantment, what it means to get back inside of a story that's bigger than your own. And so all of these songs that I'm releasing this year, um, subtly or not so subtly, talk about the story of re-enchantment, of yeah. stepping back into a story that's bigger than the one you can author for yourself, right? And I, so I think important. when you, when um, and when you're a kid, that's that comes natural. It's like easy. And, I, and yeah. it, it reminds me of, um, real quick, I don't know how much time we have, but the, when, when you did the... Um, Mercury and Lightning album. I was, I was listening to yeah. that album with my daughter. She was maybe two or three at the time and um, putting her to bed and we're listening to it. And it ended up being the commentary album and I didn't realize it. So we're listening to these songs and I fall asleep and I wake up at two o'clock in the morning and I hear John Mark McMillan's voice <laughs> talking. And I'm like, what is going on? I, this man's voice talking. About, but you were talking about um, uh, the, the the story about the drawing on, on the wall, the yep. crayon. And it just got me to thinking about how how it, with with our kids we get to relive our childhood a little bit and yeah. because that that wonder that that the that children have so naturally like i find myself like looking at my youngest one thinking man i just want to get back to that like she sees a stick and she's like amazed this is, dad look at this stick and i'm like it's a sword where yeah where where did that wonder go for life and that, yep. that like what you're talking about that bigger yeah. than a story bigger than ourselves like we get so yep. dumb yeah. as we get older you know, well, it's the t it's the tyranny of the familiar, right? And sort of that's what I think the arts do is they defamiliarize people with the world because the world is unreal, right? Yeah. The world is absolutely mind blowing. Like the fact that we exist at all is just absolutely mind blowing, yeah. and most people don't even think about that every day. Yeah, I like to exist at all is just unreal. And then you look at the world and you see these things, and we get sort of numb to it, right? Like it's a what whatever word you want to use it's a miracle it's a phenomenon yeah. it's it's something that you it's it's greater than anything you can articulate but we get so used to it and so like what we do as artists is we take a thing and we rearrange it and say hey look at this again maybe reconsider this you know why are there so many love songs why aren't people tired of love songs no because people are like maybe take another look at love think about how great this is yeah, and when exactly. you stop you're like this is, is really great like awesome. this is wonderful you know <laughs> yeah. yeah and it's the same with kids you know like a cow if you ever think about a dairy cow, how like impressive a dairy cow is, if you had never seen one, right, your mind would be absolutely <laughs> blown. Yeah. I remember driving in the car, my kids are screaming, Dairy! Ah! I was like, all right, who's dying? Who's bleeding? <laughs> they're not, they're pointing out the window. They're like, oh my God, oh my God. I'm like, what? You pull over and it's a dairy cow. It's a huge cow. <laughs> yeah. And like your first response as an adult is like, are you for real? And then you take a second and you see how engulfed they are in the story of this cow. And you realize like this thing weighs like tons, huge horns. Like it's, it's, it's mad. Like this is really impressive. Like ancient, there are ancient civilizations who used to worship these. Right. Yeah. Right. And used to worship. And I think because it actually is pretty unreal. And I just forgot how impressive a cow was because I just decided in my stupid grown up brain that it's just normal and there's yeah. nothing normal. That's the thing. Nothing in life is normal. Yeah. Everything is significant. You know, yeah. human beings are rare. Like our situation here on Earth throughout the cosmos is insanely rare, yeah. you know, and we forget about it. We feel so common and so normal. And it's just such it's so stupid because we're not normal. 
And to me, that's what we do as artists. That's what we do when we write songs, right? We reintroduce people to their lives in the world and to God. Yeah. You know? And it's such, I love that we're talking about this because we, we interviewed Zach Neese nice a while back from Gateway. And, you know, um, just never lose your sense of awe in the world. Yeah. You know, and the wonder on that. Well, we're getting time in. This has been a wonderful time with you, John. We're really, we're really grateful that you came on today. I, um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's been refreshing. And I had no idea you had the comic book collection. I knew I saw it from the sushi, you know, but I wasn't sure. Um, so when you're in Florida, stop by Vero Beach. We'll get some sushi. Right. We got some good Definitely. places. And, we'll, right. and when I'm in Charlotte, take me to your favorite sushi place. All right. But Definitely. before we get out of, out of the Praiser House today, we have this thing called the Artist Corner. And it's an opportunity. Right. We've talked about the music. We can do the plugs. We'll, after we're done here, we'll make sure everyone knows where to find you on your website. Not that they don't know where yeah. you're at already. But what do you got on your heart, man? Anything in your mind that you want to give up the, our audience at Praiser House and that, and, and that uh, collectively goes out to the world? Yeah, totally. I think two things, and I realize this concept of re-enchantment gets a little bit heady, and I've been really trying to dig in and ask myself, like, how do I make this more palatable? You know, and I, I think I, I'm using two terms. I'm using one is dreams, and the other is story, hmm. right? A dream is a story you tell yourself about what the future is going to look like, you know, and you don't have control over that future. But you do have the opportunity to choose which story you're going to fellowship with about that future. And if you choose certain stories, I think the future is going to be better. Right. Mm -hmm. And and so I'm just, you know, there's a lot of people sitting around trying to figure out what they're going to do with their lives post covid. Everyone's real excited about like being able to go outside again, be with people again. But also, I think there's going to be it's going to be hard on a lot of people, too. It's going to be hard to go back to work. It's going to be hard to go back to school, you know? And so, like, I I just hope that I can help people um, tell the right kind of stories or engage with the right kind of stories, um, you know, over this next year or two. And um, and I, I just want to, I just want to, you know, let fans know that I'm grateful for the opportunity to play a teeny role in their story, you know? Mm. Like, it's a huge thing. It's a huge thing. They might play my song at a wedding. They might play my song at a funeral. They have, you know, I've gotten, even this week, I get DMs all the time. I try, I can't promise, I try to check all my DMs, you know, but like people have allowed me to be a part of their lives. And I'm just super, super grateful that they've yeah. let me, let me be a part of their story. And I hope that I'm helping them cultivate the kind of stories that um, are meaningful and hopeful and help them. Uh, in uh, what am I trying to say here? Help them feel loved and know love and 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 to know God in a, in a way that's over time transformative, you yeah. know, to them and their lives. I hope that made sense. Yeah, it's beautiful. But, it's beautiful. Yeah. I I don't think you can be any less with that man because it shows how it shows the humbleness of your heart, you know. And we we talk about the Book of Matthew quite a bit. The the toil the soil is tender my friend. Mm. And we yeah. really appreciate that coming from the heart. Thank and you. and it's true, man. Like I want for our young audience, like it doesn't matter how big you get before that John goes, it doesn't matter how big you get um, in the world of music or business or I don't know, gardening, you know, you never know. Mm. Um, you got to be humble and you got to be able to know that, that you're, that you're being in presence in, in all of community of humanity is a stitch of fabric. Yeah. And we are the we are all together in this mission. Just be a servant, man. Yeah, yeah, be a servant. yeah totally. Yeah. John, you're welcome yeah. back on the Praiser House anytime, yeah, my well, friend. We can't wait to see you out on tour. Yes, We're gonna make definitely. sure we give you all the plugs, and uh, we look forward yeah. to the music. And God bless you and your yeah. family. I can't wait to see you soon. Yeah, man. thank you guys thank so you. much. Appreciate thank you. All right, John. We'll Blessing, see you, brother. brother. Thank all you, right. man. Mike, that was incredible. We had yeah. the one and only John Mark McMillan on the Praiser House. What a treat. Yeah, that was awesome. I didn't know about that. I mean, I knew from his, you know, from the kind of, I won't want to call podcast, but he's, you know, getting the sushi Yeah, about the comic books. That was cool. That was cool. I, yeah. It just brings back, like I told him, I feel a shame now because mine are like summer in plastic and then some yeah. are just like in a shoebox, just like hanging out. I think I had like, when I was a kid, I had a few, but I, I, I didn't have a really stable area to put them. So it, any comic books that I have are probably in a trash heap somewhere. Yeah, and now <laughs> I, now because we're best friends, I've got a new best friend. So when he decides that he's going to be around, I'm just going to have to say you can come along, but we're going to have to eat sushi. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'll, if, you know, if we're going to hang out with John Mark McMillan, I'll eat some sushi. Hey, you know, you had some sushi with me in Nashville. It was yeah. good. It, it was good. Yeah. It, it was good. I, I, it was good. 
it's good. But the fellowship and the yeah, conversation that's, together. That's what that's where I thrive on. Yeah, it is. It doesn't matter if we're eating cheeseburgers. I, you know, I, I like that. Fellowship. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, Frey out there, uh, Mike Rathke loves him some some cheeseburgers. This boy do like cheeseburgers. And we'll, we'll be, it's funny. We'll go out so somewhere <laughs> together, and and I'll be like, man, oh man, guys, this is like the best menu, Southern everything. And then Mike's like, mm, you know, which one play? And he's looking over, and he flips the menu, flips back. Uh, I'll get the cheeseburger. I'll get that cheeseburger. <laughs> and I'm like, you have now had 1.4 million cheeseburgers. I know it's terrible. I, I really needed to do it. I should just eat sushi for the rest of my life to like re. re- you know, like rewind all those cheeseburgers, yeah. probably. Well, I want to let our fans know if you haven't got involved in the Praiser House, this is the Praiser House podcast. Christian music artists being interviewed on the, the Plenty and John Mark McMillan, M C M I L L A N. So, John Mark McMillan.com. Make sure you go check out. Got a great merch store there. Mm hmm. Forward slash store. He's got some really cool stuff, and got a. I mean, look at look at the mountain. We've got yeah. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12. We have twelve projects out there that you can listen to, so you're not going to get bored. Yeah, and and then the new single, "Deliver Me," uh, which was out Super on, on the fourth. So all the social media is the same thing. You can go to the website, get to a social media, or just forward slash Instagram.com yeah. forward slash John Mark McMillan. Really pumped for the guy. He's got. He's a. He's a. He's a son of God, man of Christ. Uh, a father, a uh, husband, and he loves the outdoors. He loves comic books. Just there's so much to talk about there. Yeah. I'm so honored to have John Martin Millen on today for, for the Praiser House and for all you out there listening. Please subscribe and download the podcast today. Share it with your friends and family. We love you. God bless you. And this is the Praiser House. Yep. Later, guys. Mm-hmm.